scripture reading of God's word today is in Psalms 22, 16 through 23. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has circled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I held all my bones. People stare and glowed over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my glory. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. All my strength come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, reveal him. All you descendants of Israel, so be it. Good morning. Do you guys have children's church? Are you... We'll start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the many things that you do for us. The sunshine that we see, but Lord, more than that, the sun that you sent to us. Lord, as we approach this Christmas season, may we just think about and praise you for all the wonderful things that you've done. How you as God could give up your son. If God could come to earth, what he created to be a mere man, to be a mere man, to take upon our sin and our shame. It's just amazing, Father, and we thank you. We are in awe of you, and we will worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're celebrating the coming of Jesus. That's what the Advent candles are for, and I'll explain them a little bit later today. And it's amazing that we read all throughout Old Testament Scripture the coming of this promised Messiah, that God was not going to abandon us, that there's no way that we can um, keep the records of the law that we are sinful people. There is no hope for us without God first loving us. Verse 23 in the end of Psalms 22 said there, You who fear the Lord, praise Him, honor Him, and revere Him. Jesus, the Son of God that came to be the sacrificial lamb to die for us, to take away the sin and shame of, of this earth of, of men so that they might forever be children of God. So there are different ways that we can celebrate, celebrate this Advent season. But what does Advent mean? It means different things to different people. But basically it's the approaching day that we celebrate the birth of Christ, our Savior, Jesus, who came to this earth to save us. That by no other name can men be saved. That Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And we celebrate that on December 25th each year. But it seems like there's more and more people that don't want us to celebrate, don't they? They want to hear happy holidays. They don't want to hear anything about Merry Christmas. But it's all about the Christ child. It's about that Messiah that was promised. It was foretold for many years. And the prophecies were fulfilled completely and thoroughly with Jesus. We celebrate his birthday on December 25th. It's probably not when he was born. But that's still when we celebrate it. It is a holiday that we have. It is recognized by our government as the holiday where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It is not a holiday of giving or receiving or materialism and spending or, or Christmas pudding or anything else. It is a holiday where even the government recognizes the birth of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, we still recognize Him because He is our true Savior, our true Lord. So what is Christmas? Let's define it first before we define the Advent. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, if you're familiar with it, our dictionary changed a lot after that point. If you go back to that dictionary, you'll find a lot of differences in the way that Webster defined things in this country because they looked at it from a perspective of godly men. They looked at it from a perspective of the Bible. And in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, here's the definition of Christmas. The festival of the Christian church observed annually on the 25th day of December in memory of the birth of Christ 
and celebrated by a particular church service. The festival included 12 days. It can also mean Christmas Day. So we get a definition there from 100 and however many years ago, almost 200 years ago. If you go to Webster's 1988 dictionary, 160 years later, here's the definition of Christmas. Same Webster's dictionary. The annual festival observed by Christians on December 25th commemorating the birth of Christ or the Christmas season. Now there's a lot of things you may have caught it there or may not have caught it there that are changed or missing. Because see, things change, times change, but our God never changes. Salvation never changes. It is through no other name than Jesus Christ. No other way can men be saved. It's not going to change. It was God's perfect will, His perfect plan, and it will always be. It was known by God from before the beginning of time, and it will continue until all things are made right under Jesus Christ. Christmas box and Christmas rose can be found in the 1828 edition. So there were some traditions that were going on then. If you look in the 1988 ed uh, edition, you'll get some new definitions of Christmas pudding and Christmas tree. So I don't know, but I can gather from that that there must not have been too many Christmas trees around in 1828. Not enough that it made the dictionary. And there surely must not have been enough Christmas pudding. Well, things change. Thank goodness we get Christmas pudding now, right? <laughs> but I don't want things to change where we don't recognize that the season is about Christ, our Savior. And that is only fulfilled in one person, Jesus. He is the one who fulfilled all of those messianic prophecies. He is the one that died for our sins. He's the one when you go to the grave, you won't find his body because he's in heaven. And he's there preparing a place for us. Wow, that's what we're celebrating. Times change, traditions change, definitions change. But God does not change. His word does not change. Jesus does not change. And it is important that we recognize that so that we don't bow down to changing times. That we don't say it's okay whether it's a national holiday or not to say Merry Christmas. It is the recognition of our birth of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the season's all about. The current definition from Merriam-Webster Dictionary, if you look it up today online, You'll get a Christian holiday that is celebrated on December 25th in honor of the birth of Jesus Christ or the period of time that comes before and after the holiday. So we get some more changes there. What looks like to be a good change at first is we see that Jesus is added to Christ because so now we know who the Christ is, that it's Jesus. But maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not a good thing because there's so many things that are taken away. Like I said before, it's nice that Christmas pudding's been added, but if you haven't noticed from these definitions here, the church has disappeared. The 12 days of festival have disappeared. It's a Christian holiday now, not a church holiday. Well, what that says to so many people is it's okay to leave the church out of it. That's one reason that I don't need to go to the church and celebrate. I can celebrate Christmas just fine at home. But that's not what Christmas was. Christmas was a church holiday that for the whole Advent season we prepared our hearts in worship of the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's not the way it started. We'll get in a little differently. But it's a, where we gathered together and understood what great love the Father has for us, that He would bestow upon us the fact that we could be children of God. And all of this is possible because Jesus came, was born a man, lived a perfect life, and died for our sins. And then rose again to give us hope and expectation that we can have that no one else can have except from knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. It was a festival, if you look back in the original uh, definition. It was a festive time where there's feasting and everything. Jesus compares when we get to heaven that way that it's going to be a marriage feast. That we're going to be celebrating because of the joy that we have that has come complete. That nothing can take that away from us. It's going to be a festival like you've never seen. I saw a commercial the other night with people were festive, having a festival and all these kings and proper people and they were eating Taco Bell. I'm sorry, but it's going to be much more of a festival than eating Taco Bell. And it's going to last and last and last and last. All because God loves us. We need to 
remember that we are part of the body of Christ, that we're all God's family, that we are His children, that we need to meet together, that we need to celebrate all the things that we have as Christians so that we can tell others of this joy that we have. There's nothing wrong with celebrating at home. We should celebrate at home too. Everything should go home and we should teach our children and everything. But if we don't remember the fact of church in the definition of Christmas, what's going to happen over time? How is Satan going to get that foothold in there to where he destroys the families and everything and they don't have the time because of their busy schedules? So make sure you invite someone to church for Christmas Eve service or Christmas Day service, wherever you go, whether it's here or anywhere, and worship the true king that came to earth as a baby 2,000 years ago. The birth of Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, the promised Messiah that had been promised from days of old, the hope that the Old Testament saints had that, that was never realized, but we know from history that Jesus Christ was born. It is a fact. You can't deny that. You can't deny that there are witnesses that said there were an empty tomb, that they saw his ascension and everything else. History proclaims. So the dividing point of history is the birth of Jesus Christ. It still is today. And we have one day set aside of the year, but yet from our definition we have a whole season. We have 12 days live, leading up to it. To remember, because you can't encompass it all in one day. And we certainly want to, don't want to have that one day where we open presents and do everything else, but don't remember the present that our God gave us through Jesus Christ, His Son. Or we spend five minutes in a prayer while we do that. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is the reason for the season. Families honored Jesus in church services. They came together. Things weren't too important. Schedules weren't too busy. They worshiped the Christ child in the services in the church. They had a festival that lasted 12 days. 160 days later, the definition changed dramatically. Like I said, we don't have, let me find my definition, we don't have festival anymore. We have, we have festival, sorry. We don't have Christian church anymore, we have just Christians. The church disappeared. We don't have the 12-day festival. We have one day, December 25th. And then when we get into our further definition, it becomes a holiday. Woo, it's a paid vacation, hooray! So much more than a paid vacation. Christmas has not changed. Doesn't matter if man's definition changes. His definition changes all the time, daily, depending on what we want it to be what we find right and wrong. But God's word never changes. It has not changed. It will not change. We worship our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Christmas season, what does that mean in the current definition? Does that mean a time of shopping? Does that mean a time where we gather and eat? Or does it mean a time when we sit down and think about the air that we breathe? the life that we have, the blessings that we especially have as part of this country, the love that God has for us, why He would ever want us to be His children, us sinful, pitiful creatures. But He loves us. So when I ponder that, I think it's all about God. It's nothing about me. So that I can think when I want to think that bad thought about my neighbor because he's worse than I am, that that's not what grace is about. That grace is about God choosing to love me. Someone who is wretched, pitiful, naked, and blind. But he would choose to love me enough that he would send his own son to die for me. And then he would say, come home, I want to make you my son or my daughter, if you'll just believe. So when I ponder that and understand it, how could I ever think about my neighbor down the road as less than I am? Because the Son of God came to this earth and died for him or her just as much as me. And how much do I want to long to tell that person of the joy I have and live a life that is worthy so that they can see that, not a life of a hypocrite or a life that's contradicting, but a life that I can proclaim Jesus Christ because it was God who first chose to love me. 
So what happened to the 12 days? Where did they disappear to? What do they even mean? I challenge you to go to study up on it, look a little bit, and not look at the materialism of it. That on the 12th day of Christmas, my true love bought for me. On the 12th day of Christmas, what did God do for you? What did he do on the 11th day? What did he do 365 days out of the year for you? He never turns his back on you. He's always there for you. Always faithful and true. I got to help a girl from the Ministerial Association this week, and the timing was perfect that it was only God. It was, we actually went and helped her hours before the day was over. Her rent was due that day. I couldn't get a hold of her another day. Everything just worked out perfect that I could help her that day. And she said, you know, I've been praying and hoping. And, I, and she said, God is there for me. I said, he's always there for you. He's always faithful and true. Don't ever think that he's not. You may not understand it. You may not comprehend it. You may go through trials and tribulations on this earth that you think you cannot endure. But he's right there every minute of the day walking through with you. And when it's all said and done with, he's going to say, come home. Because that's how much God loves us. But yet there's no festival today. There's no church in the definition today. It's simply a holiday. A holiday that we're going to fight over because people don't want to see that holiday even recognized. Let alone an Advent time, 12 days of Christmas, anything else. Boy, that would really get some people offended, wouldn't it? But that's what it's all about. And if we live that life and show that, then maybe instead of being offended, maybe they would just say, well, I've got to check this out. These crazy Christians are worshiping this whole season, this Savior that I don't understand. They're wanting to give. They're wanting to love. When yet I am sitting here trying my best to be unlovable. <coughs> That's exactly what God did for us. He loved us when we were enemies, when we were unlovable. He has sent His anointed one, His chosen one, the Messiah that He had promised because He is true in His ways. We don't have to worry about that. And people don't know and understand this. And it's our job to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Many people think that Jesus' last name is Christ. You realize that? They don't know what the Christ means. They think, I'm Alan Henson, he was Jesus Christ. Jesus was the one who was promised and foretold of so long because God loves you. When you read through, it's amazing the fulfillment of prophecies down to just the perfectness that could not be manipulated or anything else. And Jesus Christ fulfilled them all. But see, people are blinded. The Pharisees were blind in that day, and we live in a world that is blinded by sin. We have to be the light. Because when you light a candle, it brings light to the room. If it was dark in here, it would be amazing how much just two candles would light up this room. And the more candles that I lit, and the more that I unified their flames, the brighter that flame would be, the brighter that light would be for all to see. Last week we read from 1 John 3, 1. And it said, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Wow. We need to read that verse every day. We need to remember what God did for us through Jesus every day. We don't need to let it come down to even a season, let alone a day. One day out of the year. So what is the Advent season? We lit a candle last week. What does it stand for? It can mean different things. You don't have to follow the tradition exactly. Generally, there's four purple candles or three purple candles and a pink candle with a white candle as a center. The white candle represents that Jesus Christ, with all purity and everything, came from heaven to earth to die for our sins. Purple is a royal color. It represents royalty. We used all purple. You can do them in any order, but generally speaking, it's love, hope, joy, and peace. We, wrote, we lit the hope candle last week. We lit the... Love candle this week is the order that I'm going in. It doesn't matter. It encompasses that we know these things. That the reason for the season is hope, love, joy, and peace. Things that we cannot have, that the world doesn't have, without knowing Jesus Christ. The word Advent is derived from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. Because Jesus Christ came to this earth. 
Originally, Advent was a season of preparation for baptism of new Christians, converts, for the festival of Epiphany in January. It had nothing to do with Christmas at all. Where Jesus was recognized as that promised Christ who came. And they looked specifically at the visit by the Magi, his baptism, and his first miracle in Cana, where he turned water into wine because we have something to celebrate again. We celebrate that God loves us so much that he fulfilled his promises in the form of Jesus Christ. It wasn't until centuries later that the Advent was connected with Christians when Roman Christians began celebrating the Advent with Jesus' coming. Not as a baby in a manger, though, as a king who would come again in judgment to rule and reign and set things right. It had nothing to do with Christmas again. But now, many years later, and we still do today, the Advent is associated with Jesus' first coming in the nativity as a babe that he came to earth. There's nothing wrong with those traditions. Traditions change because the focus of those traditions is all on Jesus Christ again. But when the focus is changing, it's happy holidays because we don't want to offend somebody, then there's where we've got to make a stand. This season is all about the birth of a Savior who came from heaven as promised to save man's sins and was fulfilled and can only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ because He is the way, the truth, and the life. So that's why we celebrate. That's why we must recognize. That's why you've got to sit down and spend time with God to see who He is, to understand how much He loves each and every one of you so that we can be those lights to the world that we can shine on. Because Jesus left this earth and said that He has put us in charge, that we are His hands and feet, that the Master has gone and He has left us with the responsibility of spreading the gospel message to others. So you might be confused about the definitions and everything, what's going on, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to understand everything to be saved, do you? You have to, have to understand that God loves you, that Jesus was God's Son, that He came and He died in your place. And if you believe that in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you will be saved. You don't have to understand everything else. So we don't have to follow exact traditions or we don't have to understand everything. But what we do need to realize is that we are worshiping and honoring God the Father and the love that He gave us through His promised Son, Jesus Christ. That is the reason for the season and it will never change no matter what definitions change. One reason we celebrate it on December 25th is because at that time the church set it up so it would combat a pagan holiday at the same time. So some people tell you, well, I don't want to celebrate on December 25th because there's a pagan holiday associated with it. We don't so celebrate a pagan holiday. We celebrate the birth of Christ, no matter when it is, no matter what day. And like I said, we should do it 365 days a year. So we have hope. We have love. We have peace. We have joy. We talked about hope last week. Hope that confirms that we are children of God. See what love the Father has lavished and poured out upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. Those who are children of God are children today, children tomorrow, and children forevermore. Nothing can take that away. That's what we are as children of God. Do you see a little bit of the hope that we have? When we ponder on love, we see the love that God has for us. Love that He would continue to love us, and that He would pour out His Son as a sin offering for us, and that He would redeem us as children. Those things are just unimaginable. They're incomprehensible. But yet God lavishly poured out His love on us. John 3.16 says, For who? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise. It's all about God and His love. It's all because of God. We wouldn't understand love. We wouldn't have families. We wouldn't have marriages. God ordained all of those things. We wouldn't have the joy in this world. We wouldn't have the hope. We wouldn't have the peace. And we surely wouldn't have love for one another. Because I wouldn't be able to stand you and you wouldn't be able to stand me, plain and simple. Because I'm selfish and ornery, as the song said. I'm trying to think what the song said earlier. Ornery. <laughs> That's me, right, sweetheart? Mm-hmm. Because I am ornery. 
but she can love me because God first loved us. And he made the institution of marriage, and she made a vow to love me in the sight of God. And she does, because I'm ornery. Romans 5, 8 says, But who? God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's all because of God. It's how he demonstrates his love. While we were still enemies, we, we go after our enemies and we try to get rid of our enemies. We don't love them and lay down our life for them. But that's the example that Jesus gave. He demonstrates his love for all mankind. God did by offering his son up to die for our sins. When we recognize that Jesus came and was born in a manger, we have to realize because of God's love that he came to die for our sins. Because that's what it's all about. To bring us back to God, to set things right. Because we could never do it on our own so that we could be children of God. And that so we could be blessed with the privilege of being his hands and feet to tell others to draw them into the family of God. If you notice verse 8 started with but though, so we need to go back a few verses. Starting in verse 6 in Romans 5 verse 6. You see, enlighten, look, observe, study this to come to a conclusion that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for who? The ungodly. Not the righteous, but the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But the complete opposite, God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, his son died for us. Jesus, the promised Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 say, But because of his great love. Whose great love? God's great love. For us, wow. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you've been saved. I challenge you to study grace. It will level you and lay you prostrate in front of God, that he could do the things that he does for someone as undeserving as you and I. That verse starts with but, so you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back, right? I'm going to go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, listen up, you, each and every one of you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, without hope, pitiful, naked, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Can't say we're not fighting a spiritual battle. Right here it is. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, God's just wrath for who we sinned against. He who created and has power over everything. So what kind of wrath do we deserve? But because of God's great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you have been saved. There's a song, right? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin, all my shame, everything else. God's grace. And we lit the candle, the first candle of hope. We lit, lighted the second candle of love today. And we're studying about love. We read chapter 3 of John last, year, last week. So let's go to John, 1 John chapter 4. Verse 9 says, This is how God showed his love. Are you seeing a pattern here? Who's it about? God. Whose love? His. Where do we fit in this? Just recipients. We received his gift. We did nothing. We can't stand on our own righteousness. We can't do anything. We're no better than anyone else. We have received a gift of grace freely from God who is loving and bestows it upon all who believe in Christ Jesus. 
Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. How? He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Not be just saved, not sit here in the church view, but live life and to live it abundantly, to go out and tell others, to live a life that brings an example to others, a light unto the world, salt and flavor and preservatives, so that they may see God through us. Verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loves us. He is love. He first loved us. We did nothing. As long as we freely accept his gift, then we are clothed with Jesus' righteousness. We can have all the hope in the world. We can start to experience and understand love love that we have for one another. Romans 8, verse 37 and 39 say no, and this is referring back to an Old Testament passage saying that the sheep have been led to the slaughter. No, we don't need to lose hope because in all these things we are more than conquerors. Death has no sting for us. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God. The love that we get how? That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Doesn't matter what you've done, good or bad, you're saved by grace. And that's a free offer to all men who will receive it. We've just got to show them and tell them. Believers, Christians, are safe children in the arms of a loving Father. Not just a God, but a Father, because that's who He is. Who He is for us, that we are called children of God. We have security. We have love that will never, ever end. So what are we to do? God makes His covenants with us. He stands true and firm to it. Should we not stand true to the faith? Should we not be lights to the world? Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. There's nothing out there, even if we live in persecuted lands, that can separate us from the love of God. It's our responsibility to be a light to the world, to tell others, and nothing is going to change what happens to us. No one can strip that from us. Death can't separate us. Paul longed to be out of this world so that he could be with Jesus, be with God forever. But he knew his duties and responsibilities were here until God called him home. So what are we to do? We're to proclaim the good news because that's what it is. It's good news that a Savior has been born in Bethlehem who is Christ the Lord. And he has come from God because God loves you. Not because of anything you've done, so it doesn't matter the good or the bad. It just matters that you realize that a Savior has been born, and He wants to desperately bring you home. So let's read 1 John chapter 4 again, verse 9. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, let's go backwards and forwards of these verses and pick up a little more of the picture. Verse 7, Dear friends or beloved, those who are loved by God, not just loved, but loved as a child, they're beloved, let us what? Love one another. See, if you don't read all of that passage, you might miss out on that point. We're supposed to love one another because of how God showed His love for us. For love comes from God, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He could have put anything else here. He could have said, Any, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who goes to church reads their Bible. But he doesn't. He said, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, I don't know about you, but I can think of somebody that I don't love. Be honest. Because we're sinners. But we're supposed to love that person. So I challenge you right now, whoever you just thought of, okay, and if you didn't think of it, think about it. 
Love that person. Because God loved you enough that He never gave up on you. He kept His promises true because of who He is. He loved you enough to send His Son so He could bring you back and call you His very own child. So why in the world would you not want to love that person whoever came to your mind? I'm not convicting. I'm just reading God's Word. That's why I'm putting it here. I'm not pointing any fingers because I'm pointing them back at myself. I thought of names, not one, but names. And I have to lay them down at the feet of Jesus. Verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God. Wait a minute. Is he hitting a little harder home? Because he didn't just say it one way, he said it the second way from the opposite. <clears throat> because God is love. That's why we love one another. Then we get verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends or beloved, since God loved us, we also ought to what? Love one another. We get it on both sides of that scripture. Do we do this? Are we guilty? Do we need to take this before God and ask for forgiveness? No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. There's that promise again. If we're loving, God is living in us. And His love is made complete in us. We're maturing. We're becoming more like Christ. More like children of God should be. God loved us when we were enemies. When we were against Him. He loved us enough to send His Son to die for us. So I ask you, do you have a good answer for not loving others? Do you have any answer for not loving others? If God loved you when you were dead, meaning that you would be completely separated from Him and deserving and receiving the wrath that you deserve, and He loved you enough to call you, why aren't you loving others enough to tell them about the reason of the season? That it's all about Jesus, the Christ. It doesn't matter what gifts. It doesn't matter about Christmas pudding or Christmas trees. It matters about Jesus, the Christ, who came. And will be coming again, as you learn if you study more about Advent. He will be coming. And we will spend eternity with Him, or we will spend eternity apart from Him. And we get to tell others so that hopefully they spend eternity with Him. It's not our purpose to save them. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. But we are called to be a light. Just as Jesus came and will light that white candle on Christmas. He came to be the light of the world. Now we are to share that light and be that light of the world. The light of the world has come to seek and save those who are lost. And Jesus will come again to take His brothers and sisters home. We've got to live a life that brings worth. A life that tells people for the reason for the season. Rejoice, rejoice in Jesus Christ. Sherry, Barb. There's a song that says for us to rejoice. And they're going to share that with us.